So you've heard us say this, that what, what we see Russia's doing, and we've been very clear about this, is that they're using energy, they're weaponizing energy, and it's choosing to, to one of the things that uh, has been out there, to shut down the pipeline of Nord Stream 1. This is my first video update coming to you from Nicosia, Cyprus, on this Wednesday morning. Let's talk about some news. You saw the opening video uh, clip coming from the Biden White House. The, uh, the White House spokesperson, Karine Jean-Pierre, has announced to all of America that Russia and Vladimir Putin, they have taken the, uh, the drastic, the belligerent, the, uh, the, the aggressive decision to shut down Nordstrom 1. And that means that, uh, that the popular department store chain, at least... Nordstrom One, wherever, wherever that specific department store is located in the United States, I'm not sure where Nordstrom One, what uh, state or city it's located in. Let me know in the comments down below. But um, Russia has decided to shut down this popular department store. And uh, this is big, big news because it means that uh, Russia is planning to shut down uh, Nordstrom Two and three and four, they're probably going to shut down all of the Nordstrom department stores in the United States. And, and that means that Americans, many Americans that want to do some upscale uh, shopping for uh, women's and men's fashions, well, they're not going to have uh, Nordstrom to go to. They're not going to be able to go to Nordstrom to shop for those fashions. So this is a really big move by the uh, Russian government to shut down the Nordstrom uh, department store, Nordstrom One. And if they do proceed to shut down all of Nordstrom's across the uh, United States, then I, I would say that the Biden White House is going to have to uh, consider this an act of war. And Congress is going to probably have to declare war on Russia because um, I, I never thought that Russia would actually make the move to shut down the Nordstrom department store chain. I mean, this is just it's. This is, this is a terrible, violent, aggressive act from the Putin regime. And, uh, and, and where does it stop? If you shut down Nordstrom, what's next? What are you going to shut down next, uh, Vladimir Putin? Are you going to shut down Apple stores? Um, are you going to shut down uh, other department stores, other, de other popular department stores, restaurant chains, uh, McDonald's, Chipotle, Burger King? I mean, where does it end? So uh, the, the Biden White House really needs to take action right away. Perhaps they could look for substitutes to Nordstrom. Maybe they can talk to the Saudis or uh, maybe Biden can make a trip to Qatar and maybe they can um, they can ship. Maybe they can put on, on, on ships, on tankers, the clothes, the men's and the women's fashions and ship them to uh, to the United States in order to substitute the fact that uh, that Russia has decided to shut down Nordstrom. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is... <laughs> I can't do it anymore. <laughs> anyway, obviously the White House spokesperson, they confuse Nordstrom and Nord Stream. It's written in the notes, Nord Stream 1. Unless, of course, the script writers actually wrote Nordstrom 1 instead of Nord Stream 1. <laughs> but uh, anyway... <laughs> She obviously confused Nordstrom and Nord Street. So uh, let's talk about some news. And uh, we got to talk about the, uh, the second front that has been opened by the Alensky regime in um, the Kharkov area, the Kharkov Oblast. It is in uh, an area, a, a town, a railroad junction, actually, an important railroad junction known as uh, Balakleya. And uh, the Ukraine military has decided to, to throw everything they've got in this direction as well. And uh, they, they have made some progress from the latest reports that I've, uh, I've taken a look at. But in, in, in the grand scheme of things, this is, this is not going to, in my opinion, this doesn't change the trajectory of, uh, of the conflict if uh, the Russian military was able to uh, to stop the Great Kherson counteroffensive, 
which is much further away from uh, from Russian reinforcements, then why would the Alensky regime believe that they would be able to mount a successful counteroffensive in Kharkiv, which is much closer to uh, to the Russian Federation and to Russian reinforcements and uh, supplies? And I've seen videos which are uh, showing uh, Russia moving in reinforcements towards that that direction. At least, at least the reports are saying that they're moving in reinforcements towards that direction. But uh, you know, if it, if the Great Kherson counteroffensive was uh, was stopped, why would the Hot Gulf, the Great Hot Gulf counteroffensive, be any different? But um, they definitely did pick a weak spot. I, it seems like the Ukraine uh, military, the Alensky regime, they picked a vulnerable area and um, they made some progress there. But I'm, I'm convinced that, that you're going to see the same results that you saw in Kherson. You're going to see them in Kharkov. Kherson was going to be this big shock and awe counteroffensive that was going to turn the tide of the, uh, of the conflict. And now it's been rebranded as um, as a slow grind that the Ukraine military is now uh, taking on in order to weaken the Russian military. And if you believe that, well, I have I have a Nordstrom department store to sell you. <laughs> and, uh, and so the um, the reports are that the Alensky regime actually went forward with this second counteroffensive against the military advice of the United States. And the U.S. Uh, military, they actually told Alensky, one counteroffensive is just about all that you can uh, handle. But Alensky went forward with this, uh, this second counteroffensive, a second counteroffensive with, uh, with no air support and, uh, and an and an inferior uh, artillery, and they still decided to open up this second counteroffensive. But um, I, I believe that Alensky did not act against. Well, I don't want to say he didn't act, act against the orders of the U.S. military. I believe that the reports that the U.S. military did indeed tell Alensky not to launch this uh, this second front, this second counteroffensive against Kharkov, are accurate. I believe that is true. But I also believe that the other factions in the Biden White House, most likely the Department of uh, State, Lincoln and Newland, the neocons, the neoliberals, I believe that this faction, which is often at times at odds with the Pentagon, I believe they told Alensky, launch a counteroffensive, a second counteroffensive in Kharkov, go for it. We need a victory. And the fact that they picked out a very, very vulnerable area I think is proof to the to the to the fact that what the Alensky regime is trying to do is to try and score some sort of uh, a victory that they can then package and sell to the collective West and to the people of the collective West, so that the leaders of the United States and of uh, the European Union can can say, look, all the all, all the billions, all the weapons that we've given to Alensky. It's uh, it's delivering results. You see, we've conquered, we've taken over the important uh, city of uh, Balaclaya. The tide is turning. We're raising a flag in Balaclaya. Victory is just months away. Just stick it out. A couple of more months. Another five or ten or twenty billion. Another twenty or thirty high Mars if we have them in in inventory. <laughs> Uh, some more tanks if we have them in inventory, whatever it is, just, uh, just, just, just stick with us, people of the collective West, citizens of the collective West. Don't protest now. Just stick with us, and Alensky's getting it done. So I, I believe that the U.S. military probably did tell Ukraine, don't launch a second counteroffensive in uh, Balaklaya. Don't do it. But uh, I also believe that the Department of State told Alensky, do it, and do it now. And so Alensky, he listens to the Blinken Newland wing of uh, the Biden White House more than I believe he listens to the uh, to the Pentagon wing of the Biden White House. Either way, I, in my opinion, and I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, but using logic, you would think that if it didn't go well in Kherson, 
which which seems to be a much a much larger, much more uh, a much grander type of counteroffensive. If that didn't succeed, where Russian forces are indeed a bit more more isolated from reinforcements, then why would a counteroffensive in Kharkov succeed? Where where the Russians, if they if they want to, and if they are planning to, can bring in reinforcements very, very quickly and can uh, and can shut down this counteroffensive. I believe within within a matter of days, and that's what I expect to see. I expect to see some uh, some switching of uh, of territory back and forth. Perhaps Ukraine makes progress, but eventually, I think Russia is just gonna going to come in and they're going to reverse those uh, results and we're going to end up very much like what we have in Kherson which is just uh just stasis you know no movement un until the Russians then want to move but uh why should the Russians move Ukraine is coming to them the Ukraine military is coming to them why should they move forward and um I've always said that the slower Russia moves the, the faster the, uh, the European Union or the collective West uh, disintegrates. The slower this military operation in Ukraine, the faster the collapse of the, uh, of the collective West. That's been my, uh, <laughs> my motto <laughs> for, for the past couple of weeks. So that's what's going on with this second front. Let's uh, switch gears and um, talk about... Zaporozhye and what happened in uh, in Zaporozhye with the IAEA report that came out, and basically the uh, IAEA inspectors they delivered their report and they said two things that I think are are of substance. The first thing they said is that uh, they recommend a type of safe zone. They would like both sides to agree to a safe zone, which is what the collective West has been trying to get to in the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant area. And so the IAEA, being a, a collective West globalist institution, they are uh, they're, they're kind, of, kind of doing the bidding of the, the collective West. They're not saying that this needs a demilitarized zone, which is what we heard from the collective West two, three weeks ago. We, we got to create a demilitarized zone in, uh, in this area, but they're saying we need a safe zone. And so, you know, that means uh, no, no Russians, no Ukrainians or, or jointly monitored or international monitors as well. This just means kind of, kind of taking this area out of Russian control and moving it towards the neutral comment, the, the, the neutral uh, column, which in reality means moving it towards the collective West column because Neutrality means the United Nations and the IAEA, and that means the collective West. So that was their first recommendation, is a safe zone. Uh, I read the statements from the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, and reading his statements with regards to the Zaporozhye IAEA report, he's hinting at the fact that Russia is not going to agree to, uh, to a safe zone. They're not going to, uh, to go for that. But the second uh, conclusion that the IAEA inspectors gave in this report was kind of no conclusion at all. And it was that um, no one is, they didn't put any blame on either side for the shelling of the, uh, of the nuclear power plant. They didn't, uh, they didn't say Ukraine was shelling the power plant. They didn't say Russia was shelling the power plant. They didn't uh, put the blame on any side. They didn't come to any conclusions with regards to the uh, shelling of the, uh, of the power plant, to the artillery strikes of that area. They completely avoided that, uh, that topic. They just put out their typical generic statements saying, saying that the shelling has to stop. They didn't lay blame on any one side. And uh, when I look at a statement like that, I consider that a win for Russia. That's a victory for Russia. The fact that the IAEA didn't put out a statement saying that Russia is at fault 
to me shows that the IAEA definitely knows that Ukraine is at fault. Now, I've heard uh, interviews from, uh, from a couple of inspectors who claim that it wasn't part of the IA's, IAEA's mission to, uh, to try and figure out who was shelling the, uh, the nuclear power plant that wasn't part of, their, uh, of the purpose for them being there. And so, okay, that's, that's accepted. But um, I believe the IAEA, when they were at this, uh, this facility, they saw the evidence, they were presented with the evidence, and I believe that they definitely understand that Ukraine is indeed shelling that nuclear power plant, but they can't put that in the report. Because if they put that in the report, then they're going against the, uh, the orders and the wishes of, the, of their collective West uh, masters, right? So they can't put that in there. And the fact that they couldn't find any evidence whatsoever that Russia was shelling the, uh, the nuclear power plant means that the IAEA had to come down with a report that said, you know, it's, we're not going to lay blame on any one side. And so if, if the IAEA had any evidence, even an inkling of evidence that Russia was, uh, was attacking that nuclear power plant, they would have put that in the report, believe me. But they couldn't come up with anything. Zero, zilch, nada. And so instead of laying blame on Ukraine, they said, we're not going to take sides. So I actually think the fact that the IAEA took, uh, took a neutral position as far as laying blame with regards to the artillery shelling, I consider that a win for Russia. It means that, uh, that they couldn't find anything on Russia with regards to the Zaporozhye NPP. So let's now discuss what is going on, an update with regards to the Russian travel ban. We have an update with regards to the Russian travel ban, and this is coming from the EU Commission, which has, stating that, which has stated that the travel ban could be enforced as early as next week. And we have a statement from the EU's, let me find who this person is, the EU's Commissioner for Home Affairs, Yiva Johansson. She said that Russian citizens should not have any easy access to the EU. And she told reporters that at the moment there is no basis for trust, no basis for a privileged relation between the EU and Russia. And with that being said, the European Union Commission has approved the suspension of the visa facilitation agreement, which means the multi-entry um, Schengen visa for uh, Russian citizens to travel to the European Union. And on top of that, there are, uh, there are reports saying that the European Union will actually up the fee that Russians pay should they want to obtain uh, visas to the European Union. And that fee is going to be increased from, 80, from 35 euros to 80 euros. And the processing time for visas will also be increased to as long as 45 days from a current 10 days. So the new rules would make it more expensive and time consuming for Russian citizens hoping to travel to the EU to get a visa if this is approved by the council. An 80, an 80 euro service fee instead of a 35 euro service fee and 45 days for the, uh, for the processing times instead of 10 days. So um, basically this is a travel ban. <laughs> this is a travel ban. The, uh, the European Union, they're framing this as a suspension of the facilitation agreement. You heard her words in her statement. Russian citizens should not have easy access to the EU. She's saying it right there. And she's saying that there is no basis for trust and no basis for a privileged relation between the EU and Russia. So the fact that they're suspending the, the multi-entry visas, the fact that they're increasing for, for other visas, I guess, I guess this is for regular one-time visas, that they're increasing the, uh, the processing times and the application fees is, is a signal that this is 
this is pretty much an, an all-out Russian uh, travel ban. This is, this is basically telling the Russians that want to travel to the EU, even if you want to travel to the EU, you're going to have to wait a month, a month and a half for a visa, and you're going to have to pay 50 euros more, 55 euros more, no chance. And you don't get the, the multi-entry visas anymore either. The multi-entry, multi-length multi visas, that's also scrapped. So this is, this is pretty much a blanket <laughs> travel ban. And um, I knew this was coming. I saw this coming a while ago. And so we had statements from Schultz and Macron and Borrell who said, no, 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 this is not going to happen. We recommend against this. But it's always, you know, that, that's the rule of thumb. When it comes to the collective West, it's always the hysterical, neocon, belligerent voices that always win out. They always win out. Any type of moderate uh, voices or any type of moderate um, suggestions, they never win out. It's always the crazies that win the day when it comes to the collective West, always. And so Lithuania and Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Finland, They were the most belligerent, they were the most hysterical, and, uh, and they won out. That is always the rule of thumb. And, and it holds true for Ukraine as well. Moderate voices which say, uh, Elensky, don't mount uh, a second uh, counteroffensive, a second front, don't do it. The crazy voices, the Newlands, the Blinkens, the State Departments, no, no, we need to ramp up. We need to ramp up. They win out. And so you're going to see a lot of Russian tourists going to, uh, that want to travel, say, in the region, in this region. You're going to see them going to, uh, to Turkey, a whole boatload of them. And uh, you actually have statements coming out of uh, high-level Turkish officials saying, Russians, come in. <laughs> you're welcome. Holiday here. Buy property. Uh, you know, come to Turkey. We welcome you. And so Turkey comes out the big, big winner in uh in all of this i'm gonna find out about uh cyprus and see what the uh what the travel policy is with regards to russians and cyprus because cyprus is not in the schengen and i'm not sure if the cyprus government if they're going to allow russians to travel to cyprus with a schengen visa or if you're going to have to uh apply for a visa to enter uh, Cyprus online. And it's just going to be um, a non schengen travel visa only to Cyprus, not to the European Union, but only to Cyprus. So I'm going to find out exactly what the details are there. And I'll get back to, to everyone that is watching from Russia that may be interested in visiting uh, Cyprus. I just want to find out if you can do, if, you'll be, if you will be able to do that with a, with a Schengen visa that you currently may have, or if you're going to have to get a new Uh, visa to visit Cyprus, which is easy to get a Cyprus visa. You can get it online and uh, I believe it's free or it's very inexpensive. It's like two, three euros. I'll find out if they're going to up those fees as well, if they're going to increase those fees under the orders from the uh, European Union. Anyway, um, so Turkey, Turkey is the big winner in all of this. They're going to get all the Russian tourism uh, with regards to the region, the, the, the European uh, continent say they're going to get all the Russian tourists there. And of course, Russians will be able to travel to, uh, to everywhere, everywhere else in the world, <laughs> even the United States, <laughs> even the United States, the U.S. is not putting a travel ban. So the European Union shoots itself once again in, uh, in the foot, which is done a thousand times. So Erdogan, since we're on the subject of Turkey, he actually came out with a statement And uh, he said that, Tur that the EU, with regards to the gas crisis, they only have themselves to blame. The entire gas crisis is the EU's fault. Erdogan told journalists that Europe is reaping what it sows when it comes to the natural gas shortages. He said, I think that Europe will spend this winter with serious problems. Turkey at this, at this stage has no such problems with gas supplies <laughs> it reaps what it sows europe reaps what it sows the eu the eu reaps what it sows because serbia 
is uh, they've uh, they've inked deals with uh, with Gazprom, and they're not going to have any gas problems. And Hungary has uh, has signed long-term gas agreements with Gazprom, and they're not going to have any problems. But the rest of the European Union, well, they definitely reap what they sow. And that is why the collapse is, uh, is happening right in front of our eyes. I mean, it's happening in real time and it's happening a lot faster than anyone would have ever predicted. Uh, I, I would have never guessed that the collapse would be happening in, uh, in late August, early September. I would have said October, maybe November, November, December, but to see it happening this quickly, that is, uh, has a very, very bad sign for the EU. And you know that Erdogan is, is just, he's loving it. He is loving it because the EU has uh, snubbed Turkey for 30 years for entrance into the European Union. And I bet you that Erdogan is just like, whew, boy, did I dodge a bullet there by not getting into the European Union. Boy, did they do me a favor by not letting me into the EU. You know that Erdogan is just like, man, Thank God we didn't enter that, uh, that prison cell. <laughs> wow. Oh, boy. Uh, Croatia, I think, is going to be adopting the euro currency. Boy, what are you doing, Croatia? I believe that Croatia is set to adopt the euro, if I'm not mistaken. Don't do it. Don't you see what's happening? <laughs> Why would you go into the euro now that everything's collapsing? Uh, anyway, uh, that was the statement from Erdogan. Let's do a couple of... Um, of clown worlds. I've got two clown worlds to talk about. And the first one is a report, oh boy, saying that uh, a, US intelligence, a US intelligence report saying that Russia is now getting their weapons from North Korea because they're out of weapons. So <laughs> they're out of weapons. So now they have to turn to North Korea in order to continue to uh, to fight the uh, the Ukraine military, so you know maybe the the great Kherson counteroffensive and now the great Kharkov counteroffensive are indeed uh, planned and meant to be a slow grind of the of the Russian military, because according to U.S. intelligence, Russia is running out of uh, weapons, and so these counteroffensives offensives are just going to uh, to bleed the Russians of whatever last uh last supplies they have before the collapse of the russian military and then the collapse of the kremlin and then Alensky will be riding into red square um to take over <laughs> to take over the uh the operation <laughs> right okay let's see a newly declassified intelligence report is alleging that russia is buying millions of artillery shells and rockets from north korea and what U.S. officials say is the latest sign of desperation amid depleting Russian munitions after six months of war in Ukraine. The United States provided few details from the declassified intelligence about the exact weaponry, timing, or size of the shipment, and there is no way to independently verify the sale, according to the New York Times, which was the first to reveal the declassified U.S. intelligence. The U.S. officials said that beyond short-range rockets and artillery shells, Russia was expected to try to purchase additional North Korean equipment going forward. Yeah. So they're purchasing drones from Iran. They're purchasing everything else from North Korea. And, um, and the collapse is coming for the, for the Russian military. They're down to their last, you know, couple hundred bullets. That's it. There's not much left. And, and, and that is the brilliance of, uh, of Alensky's military planning. You see, he held it all back for six months. He allowed Russia to, to gain the territory that they gained. He allowed the uh, EU economy to, to collapse. He allowed the energy situation to collapse. He allowed the collective West to collapse. He allowed hyperinflation. He allowed inflation, which is going to lead to hyperinflation. He allowed the gas to be cut off, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 to be shut down. He, he did all of this, this planning, this was all planned for six months. And now the timing is perfect for him to, uh, to strike and to launch the counteroffensive in the south and then the counteroffensive in, uh, in the northeast. 
which will be the final uh, death blow to the Russian military because they just don't have any more missiles, any more bullets, nothing. And they have to turn to North Korea. North Korea is going to be the country that's going to save the Russian Federation. It's all fallen on the shoulders of, uh, of King, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> that's who it's all fallen to. Kim Jong-un is the only person that can save Russia now. So that is the clown world <laughs> with regards to this intelligence report. And, uh, all right, all right, if the U.S. intelligence says that Russia is, is running out of ammo, it must be true. It must be true. And, um, <laughs> let's do another clown world because this was, this is also a very interesting, an, an interesting tweet from Euromaidan Press. It says, Ukrainian Buk M1 operators destroyed a Russian plane without firing a shot. The brigade found target and turned on backlight radar. Radar exposure warning signals sounded in Russia invaders' cabin. This stunned pilot do much that he ejected and plane crashed. Okay, so the English is a little, a little off there, but you can see the photo of the, I guess, the Ukrainian Buk operator with his, uh, you know, thumbs up, all good. And um, yeah, that is how good the, uh, the Ukraine military is. They have pensioners with rifles taking down uh, fighter jets, Russian fighter jets. They have uh, ghosts, ghosts uh, taking out uh, 50 Russian jets at one time. They have uh, Snake Island destroying uh, Russian soldiers. They have Avengers in Zaporozhye who are also uh, destroying the Russian military. They have goats. They have actual animals, goats, which are taking out entire uh, brigades. Like they're just wiping out entire brigades. They actually have goats doing this. Um, they also had children, which are operating drones as well, taking out Russian forces. And now you have book operators who don't even need to, uh, to do anything. They don't need to, to fire a single shot. They just turn on the backlight radar, and then the Russians being, you know, the Russian pilots being so lost and incompetent that they are because Hollywood has told us how, uh, how incompetent Russians are, right? We've been, that's been beaten into us over the last 20, 30 years, right? Um, the Russian pilots, they get spooked and, and they eject and the plane crashes. That's how good the, uh, the Ukraine military is. That's how good the collective West military and strategy is. What can, what can one say? What can one say? You don't even need to fire the book. Remember those books from uh, the MH17 incident? Those book uh, missiles? That's all I've got. <laughs> that is all I've got. I will end it there, everybody, coming to you from a modern, a modern downtown, Nicosia, Cyprus, the Duran.locals.com. Check out uh, Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran's channel, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. Find us there and go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code good day. Time to get a coffee. Not beer, but a coffee. Maybe I'll come here later in the afternoon to grab a beer at the Hofbrau Munch Beer House. Take care. <laughs>